isn't as strong as it should be after the uh, last night. Uh, I don't have it. Do I have control? Oh, I see. Putting this a bit higher. Wow. Actually moving it. <laughs> Trying that? No, no. It's not, it's not, the, it's not the mic. Just a second. It's not the mic. It's the box. How about now? Well, well there's something that's shielded, shielded by, by that. Oh, by that. Let me just try it so it's less shielded. How's that? Better? Ah, uh, well, it doesn't matter. I can talk loud. I'm good. Okay, good. Uh, I'm good. I've, I, I've, I've split my talk into three sections, and we'll split in the middle for a break. Uh, and I have no, I actually have a fourth section, so I can just go on and on. But I'd rather that we stop and talk about things, so, and I would like people to interrupt me, because I'm going to be, a lot of the slides I'm going to show you are slides I usually show to an astronomy audience, and a lot of things will be on those slides that you might not have heard of or know anything about. Uh, feel free to stop me. I'll try to explain jargon as I go. I will forget. Please ask me what's a quasar or whatever when we hit it. Um, uh, OK, so uh, there, are, there are a lot of places where machine learning could be very valuable in astronomy. Uh, and in fact, there are a lot of places where machine learning is already having a huge b impact in astronomy. Uh, I'm going to talk about some classification stuff in the middle of this uh, presentation. Uh, there's a lot of anomaly detection things that people are thinking about. In fact, a very uh, uh, a lot of interesting, you know, astronomers image the sky continuously and take spectra continuously. And uh, finding anomalies in unusual objects is a really big part of what we do and, and has led to a lot of the most important discoveries <coughs> in, uh, in, in astronomy from the beginning. In fact, astronomy really is, in some ways, the study of anomalies. Um, there's a huge amount of data now in astronomy. Well, huge, it depends wh who you are. Uh, I think of it as huge. It's about, uh, but it's, it's, man it's huge, but it's manageable. It's about a petabyte. There's roughly a petabyte of astronomical data right now, uh, which means it's a big data set. There's tons to do, but it's also small enough that you can actually manage it yourself. At NYU, we spin about a third of all astronomical data just ourselves. Um, and, uh, there's big model problems where, where you know, if you want a model of the sky and a model of all the astronomical imaging, there's parameters for every object on the sky, and then there's parameters for every image you've ever taken. And so when you put it all together, you're talking about uh, um, billions of parameters if you really wanted to make a model of all, everything in astronomy, which we do. Um, and, uh, uh, and then there's a lot of decision-making kind of operations things. So right now, there are a lot of projects that have many telescopes working around the globe, and they want to schedule those telescopes and use them in unison. And there's a lot of questions about uh, resource allocation that people don't know how to answer. And, and uh, more interestingly even than that is experimental design. If you want to make sure that your survey has high probability of making discoveries or doing important measurements, you might want to actually apply machine learning to the, real, the really fundamental decisions about what you're operating and how. I am not going to try and survey all this. There's co whole conferences on this subject. I'm going to basically just brag about things I myself have done and try to give you a sense of where there are other directions you can go uh, from, these, from the, the things we've done, sort of give you a sense just by examples. Uh, so I'm just going to really talk about three very detailed examples. Um, what, before I start, I want to just say that uh, for, I run in a completely open mode. My group works completely exposed on the web. The view graphs for this talk are visible in the SVN repository. And if you look at it, you'll see that I checked in my view graphs about five minutes ago. Um, so that might be represented in other ways in the talk. But, the, um, uh, but most astronomers do work fairly open. We are not... It's, this is not like geo, not geo, geology or you know, where somebody discovers you know, gold somewhere and they are all secretive. Astronomers are very open with their methods and with their data. And in particular, almost all the data that have ever been taken are available <coughs> on the web for free. Anybody can use it. So if you have methods and you have interest, you can get started. There's no barriers to entry in astronomy. And also, the, the fact that there's a lot of code on the web, you know, data on the web aren't that useful without there also being code on the web. That's why I sort of connect these two things. 
uh, if you want to get started using astronomical data, you usually need to look at somebody's code to understand how to get started. Okay, and uh, I, the work of many people will get touched here, but the three most important collaborators are uh, Joe Bovey and Dustin Lang, who are both students that I worked with and who are now postdocs. Uh, uh, Bovey was directly advised by me, Dustin Lang was advised by Sam Royce, and, uh, and by, by me jointly. Um, and uh, Sam Royce was really the uh, origin for almost all this work and has some connection to all of this work. He's the reason I got uh, interested in this uh, uh, kind of stuff. Okay, good. So my first example is actually a toy example. This is not, this was an astronomical research project, but you'll see it's a slightly odd one. It's a toy, and, but I wanna show you this toy because it's a very clean example of a whole bunch of issues that come up in astronomy. So here's the, here it is. Here's what we did. We started, this is Dustin Lang. We started by doing an image search on Yahoo Images for the phrase Comet Holmes in quotation marks. Okay? And we got back some 3,500 images or thereabouts, a few thousand images. This is a perfectly random subsample of those images, meaning we went through them carefully and chose these. Um, and, uh, and we actually have permissions from all of these authors uh, to republish their photo in an astronomical journal. And not a single one of these authors w expressed any surprise that we wanted permission to publish their picture in an astronomical journal. <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh, now it's, it's hard in this light to see, and I don't want to close the curtains further because natural light is good for people. Um, uh, but you can look in my slides when they're on the web. About, well, most of these images are images of the sky, but not all of them. And um, some of them are actually pictures of a comet. So this is a picture of Comet Holmes, very clearly. That, it's that big nob ne nebulous thing there. And, uh, uh, but many of them are images of the sky, not of the comet, and then many of them are not images of the sky. Now, the last project I'm gonna to talk to, to you about, is, so I said I'm gonna talk about three projects. The last project I'm gonna talk about is a project in which we can take an arbitrary image of the sky and tell you where it is on the sky. It's an image recognition system for images of the sky. It's a very reliable system. And we ran that, so I'm gonna tell you about that at the end. I'm not gonna tell you about it now, but what I will say is we ran it at all these images. And the images on which our calibration system failed are marked with an asterisk. So image K, for instance, we were not able to identify what part of the sky that is. <laughs> um, similarly, we were not able to get image I there, even though it's very obviously what part of the sky that was, although, I mean, you have to know what time it was taken. Um, and let me point out one cute one. Oh, it's hard to see, but image Q there, it's hard to see, but image Q successfully calibrated as an image of the sky, and it is a view through a telescope dome. You see how most of what's in that image is building. This is a, see, this is the building, and there's a telescope here, and there's a little patch of sky visible, and we were still able to calibrate that. Because our system's very robust to the, the distracting features in the image, it's really just looking for stars and then asking, do I recognize the stars? So anyway, we recognize the stars for a bunch of those uh, images. So what are we gonna do with that? Well, the first thing we did, this is now, this visualization here now is a patch of the sky. So this is a patch of the sky. It's uh, about 20 degrees on a side. So this is a small patch of the sky. And what I've plotted here is where all those images lie on the sky. And these images, which remember we found by typing Comet Holmes into Yahoo image search, uh, do not lie randomly distributed all over the sky. They're very, very concentrated in a particular patch of the sky. And if you wondered why, you could overplot the NASA JPL trajectory for Comet Holmes uh, when it came through, and Comet Holmes came through this, we actually came up th this way and then through like that. And the reason that comets go on orbits on the sky like this is something you were supposed to have learned in high school, but may not have. And it's because we're on the Earth 
and we're orbiting and the comet's orbiting, so sometimes we are sort of going past the comet and there's a parallactic motion where the comet looks like it goes backwards. That's when the planets go into retrograde, which apparently has implications for your love life. Um, but so this, the, the comet went retrograde, and the point at which a comet goes retrograde is usually interesting because that's when the comet is closest to you, so when it's bright and when it's brightest. Now, if you look at this very, very carefully, you'll see that the distribution, and it's hard to see because of the light in here. I don't know if I have a better, no, I don't have a better image of it right now. Um, uh, the distribution of images along this line are, is very non-uniform. There's, there's a whole bunch here, and then interest kind of dies out, and then it becomes interesting again here. It becomes interesting suddenly right here, and it becomes less interesting, and then it becomes interesting again here to whoever is putting images on the web. Now, if we wanted to understand this data set completely, you can see we have to understand not just the comet, but also why people put photos on the web. See how that's going to enter into our analysis of these data? Um, and one important fact about this comet is in October 2007, it brightened, brightened by 10 magnitudes. It went from uh, being an object where you needed a Bernard quality backyard telescope to see it to one that you could see with your naked eye. It happened on a particular day in 2007. And you can imagine we're going to rediscover that in a second. Now, instead, this here, I was just showing you the, the footprints of the images. Now we can take those images and actually co-add them. Right, so now we're just taking the content of the images and averaging them together. You see what I, operation we're doing? We're like making the mean of the images, weighted mean. And, and now you can see the trajectory of the comet as a scar on this image, but also you can see all sorts of other things. First of all, all sorts of other stars appear because there's been a lot of images taken of this patch of the sky, so you start to see there, there are stars persistently. But the weirdest thing is you also see there are lines connecting the stars. And that's because some of the images that successfully calibrated were not, image, were not photographs of the sky, but diagrams of the sky. Because our software is agnostic about whether the photo was drawn by a human or taken by a camera. In fact, uh, we don't, that's a very interesting question when you think about the things I'm gonna talk about later. Uh, how do we know we aren't punked? Now, you cannot see this from where you're sitting, but if you look very, remember that the comet got really, really interesting right there? Notice that's the place where it became brighter. You can't see the comet here. It becomes very bright up there. That's where the comet became bright. That's why it became interesting. We'll come back to that in a minute. But then if you come down, remember I said it got interesting again here. Well, if you see right here, there's a red, vague red blob you might be able to see there. Some people can, some people can't. It depends on whether you're red, green, color blind. But anyway, right here, is the California Nebula, which is a very beautiful astronomical object. And the reason the comet became interesting again here is it was right next to the California Nebula and you could take a photograph that would impress your friends or that you could sell. And Julie, a lot of people who put beautiful images of the sky on the web are actually selling them. And they put it on the web in low resolution and then you can buy it from them at high resolution. Um, Okay, good, so now, if you look at the images you get on the web, there's a lot of information inside those images because they have header information. And one of the important pieces of header information is the EXIF time. Well, all the header information in a JPEG, say, is called EXIF, and one of the things you can put in your EXIF header is a time. And this is the distribution of times we observed in that set of images, the images that successfully calibrated. And the red dashed line is the exact moment at which the comet brightened by 10 magnitudes. So you see how you could have discovered by monitoring this web search that something interesting happened to this comet because a massive change happened in the number of images that were hitting the web. Um, uh, one of the incredibly frustrating things about uh, EXIF headers on images is that the time thing, and you all know this while you're here on vacation, is that the time field in the camera does not include a time zone. It's not an ISO 8601 compliant date stamp, and therefore, actually, there's a 24-hour uncertainty in any time you get on an image, because you don't know which time zone it was taken in. I'll show you in a minute. We can infer the time zone it was taken in, uh, but, and, we can tell, and the distribution over time zones is not uniform. 
uh, but, uh, uh, but in fact, the EXIF information is, is not very reliable. One, the other problem with the EXIF information, I have to say, is that it often gets reset. I'm going to show you that. It's not always, the date on the photo on the web is not always the date the photo is taken. Um, one thing, if you're interested in investment strategies, uh, you can also find out the manufacturer. Um, on this basis, I have utterly failed to make any money, but uh, somebody might figure out a way to make money off this. But, it, but one of the, the, you can tell just by looking at this histogram of manufacturers that this is an unusual object. In fact, you can tell from this histogram that it must be an astronomical object. You see why? Well, the first big hint is that the number one camera is not the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I haven't. <laughs> it can't be, of course, because these are this the common came around a long time ago. But uh, uh, but the really big hint is that S Big is the third biggest manufacturer, and S Big does not make cameras. S Big makes CCDs for astronomers, for amateur astronomers. So th th this is a pretty serious group of amateurs we've hit when we did this search because uh, they're very, they have good equipment. They have real, uh, and Celestron also appears down there. And that KAF thing, I think, is also a... Okay, good. So how do we make a model of these data? What we want to do is we want to understand the data, and we want to see, can we learn things about the universe from looking at these data? And one of the problems with trying to learn something about the universe from these data is you also, on the, along the way, you unfortunately have to learn about astrophotographers, right? Because this is a data stream that's coming to us through the web. And as you saw, astronomers have very strange reasons that they want to take a picture. And so if we want to make a responsible model of the data, we're going to have to model the astronomers too. So here's our model. So the, uh, there's a ton of symbols in here. Let me just, and there's, this is about the most complicated equation I'm going to show. But th this equation has a lot of things in it that are generic to things we're working on in astronomy. So it's useful to look at it. So first of all, probabilistic reasoning. So we're talking about the probability for our data given various parameters. And for each image, the image has a pointing. This alpha i is like where it is on the sky. So we're, that's the data we're going to try and model. And then that image also has a size. This is the angular size of the image. There are little tiny images. By the way, little tiny images are more informative because you, they locate the comet more accurately. So, uh, so this is the size of the image. And then the, this omega are parameters of the comet, the orbit of the comet. And then theta is parameters of um, of things we don't care about. <laughs> so this is going to be parameters like uh, parameters like how do astrophotographers frame their comets and when do astrophotographers take images and things like that. So all of those parameters are going to go in here. These are the things we don't want to know. Uh, and then th we're going to try and understand things about the comet. Other people care about astrophotographers, by the way. So you could marginalize this model differently and learn about astrophotographers and get rid of all that annoying comet detail. Uh, and that's one of the great things about probabilistic modeling is you have, you, you can look at, you can either ignore the internals that you don't want or you, the internals could be useful. Um, and, and then furthermore, this, this model breaks down further because some of those images that we got were images of the comet. Some of them were images of kittens, but they're out. We aren't even considering those because they didn't successfully calibrate. They didn't successfully get a position on the sky. So they went, but some of them are images on, that aren't of the comet, actually, it turns out. So a lot of the images are, you know, somebody has said, here are my images of Comet Holmes and all the other things I took images of last night. And then Yahoo Image Search just still sees those as tagged with Comet Holmes. So our model is a mixture of good images and bad images, where the, some of the images are, in fact, images of the comet, and then other images, uh, you can see over that 1 minus p good over there, some of them are, are just random directions on the sky. And that our model over here, that background model is that if it isn't an image of the comet, it just could be anywhere on the sky. And that's actually not a very good model because almost all images that amateur astronomers take of the sky are of the Orion Nebula. So really, it should be a delta function on the Orion Nebula. But, uh, but anyway, it's the... Uh, 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 for our 
purpose is, one of the things we've really learned in these kinds of models, and that's a very generic thing, is that if there's an aspect of your problem that you don't care very much about, like the images that aren't of the comet, you do have to model them. You don't have a choice, because they're contaminating your data streams. You have to model them. But you don't have to model them very well, we've learned. So as we complexify that background model, it doesn't change our influence, inferences about the comet very much. Um, uh, so anyway, going on, we then had to have a model for how the astronomers placed the comet in the image. So the, w we asked, where did the comet, where did the, the uh, the astronomer put the comet in the image. Is it in the, is, and we asked, we have an incredibly simple model here, which is not a good model. And you'll see it, it causes problems. We assume that the, the uh, astronomer basically tries to center the comet in the image. And so we're actually looking, it's a centering model. But anyway, and then finally, there's one last thing, which is that we need to know the times at which the images were taken. Uh, because the comet is moving, so the time is part of the model. Um, and so in, in, in other words, in, this good mo in the good component, the foreground component of this mixture model, the time matters because it's where the question is, is the comet in the image? Uh, and of course, a lot of, the, a lot of the images have no EXIF information at all, so they don't have a time. A lot of the images we got had no times. And then the ones that did have a time, we still didn't believe them. Many of those times are wrong. In fact, I can show you that the times are wrong. Uh, and the reason the times are wrong is that the astronomers took their images and then combined them in some way and then made, uh, you know, with some piece of software. And that software overwrote the timestamp and put a wrong timestamp on it, uh, which is shocking and horrifying to an astronomer. Um, but anyway, there it is. OK, good. So our model is not a model of a comet. It's a model of the way people point their cameras. And the comet model is actually not a big uh, part of the model. Um, and one of the important things is that images have this metadata on them, but we don't trust the metadata. And, uh, and if you want to reconstruct metadata, if you, if you have data and you don't fully trust it, you have to have a model of the, the insane robot that made the metadata. Um, and, and you might think, well, this is crazy. You're working with these images on the web. But actually, in every single astronomical project I've ever worked on, we've never fully trusted the source of the data. I've had lots of data coming from observatories, professional observatories, with wrong timestamps, with wrong uh, pointing information. Wrong, I've even had images where it told me that the instrument that took the image was the wrong instrument. Um, because you know somebody copied some block of code into some other block of code, and then it overwrote the headers with the wrong information. Um, you never really trust your data. So one of the reasons we did this project was to ask, could we do a scientific research project with a set of data where we really, we didn't even know where the data came from, which is the case here. We don't know where all these data came from. Um, I have a lot to say about Galaxy Zoo. You may have heard about this project where you know, you can, it's a game where you can look at galaxies on the internet and you can classify them and your data get used. It's, it's an interesting game because, well, the most interesting thing about it is that people find it fun to look at hundreds of thousands of galaxies and click radio buttons. Um, but, the, but it produces very unreliable information about the galaxies. So you have to make it reliable by modeling the behavior of the people clicking on the galaxies. So anyway, what we're, there's a sense in which what this project is is sci citizen science because we're taking this data that come from, coming from random people and doing science with it. But the funny thing is the participants in this study aren't, aren't, they don't know they're in the study. They just put images on the web. Um, so here are the results. Uh, this is plot is hard to read, but the, the, the blast of, uh, there's a spray of solid, this is a, this, what looks like a solid red line is a spray of samples from our posterior probability distribution over comet orbits. And then the dotted line there is the true orbit from NASA JPL. Um, and, uh, uh, and there's various things I could say about this. But one thing, one thing that the conclusion we made in this paper, and this is the reason the paper is a toy, is we concluded that if a comet gets named and lots of amateur observers go and observe it, we can discover it on the web which most people don't think of as the normal way of doing discovery. Um, uh, so that's not a very good, not a very valuable conclusion. However, we, we learned that we can derive 
fairly precise dynamical information from very heterogeneous data. And that's really what we're interested in. We're interested in the future of trying to get all the information you can out of dynamical data sets. Um, but one interesting thing is the re this, you see our models are systematically off. Our, our posterior distribution is actually off the main model. It, that can all be traced to the data that come through this uh, North American nebula. And the reason is that when the comet was near the North American nebula, the astronomers did not center their images on the comet. They centered their images on the halfway point between the comet and the nebula. And so our pointing model is wrong, and that led to wrongness here. So uh, as usual, the failure of the model is just as interesting as the success. Um, and we. And obviously, we, we can see all sorts of ways we could generalize this to have captured that. One of the amusing things about this problem is we never actually looked in any of the images to see if there was a comet there. So at no step did we ever do that. So that would help, too. We would do better if we did that. Um, but, but really, this was a question about how do you model data probabilistically, especially when you don't believe anything in particular about the data. Uh, here are those times again. This is a hard figure to read. But basically, each vertical bar is a time stamp. This has a horrible nonlinear axis. That's why it's hard to read. But each vertical bar is a time stamp. And these are the small images, and those are the big images. The small images have a very well-constrained time stamp by our model. The big images have very badly constrained time stamps. The time stamps themselves don't, aren't points in this diagram. They're lines that are 24 hours long, because we don't know about the time zone. But anyway, from this information, you can see, if you're very eagle-eyed, you can see that the time zone distribution is not uniform. And then the, but the more interesting thing that you can see is that when the EXIF times are wrong, they're always after the date at which the image was taken. There's very few outliers that are where the time is before the date the image was taken. And actually, in at least one of these cases, it was an image from the previous pass of the comet many decades ago. So it's actually totally wrong. Everything about one of those is wrong. Um, you can do this for other comets. Here's Hyakutake. I'm not going to talk about other comets. But one thing that's funny to say about Hyakutake, so you can see this comet, if you're, if you're eagle-eyed again, you can see that the comet actually has a long tail here. See, this is the path of the core of the comet. And you can see that the individual images of the comet have a tail like this. Because of that, amateur astronomers tend to point their telescopes so that the comet goes down a diagonal of the image. So the centering model would be completely wrong here. A better centering model here is that the comet's in the corner of the image for this data set. OK, good. That's, I, that's all I was going to say about that. I just wanted to put up a, uh, a problem that kind of lays out some of the things we're thinking about. That is a toy problem. But it's very generic in the sense that there, in all of our data, there's, we, there's things about the data we don't trust. And then also, in any process that we have some process that generates the data, there's always data in our data stream that weren't generated by the process we think they were. So for instance, when you take an image, most of the pixels are measurements of the intensity field coming into the camera, but a few of them are affected by cosmic rays. And so whenever you model an image, it's always a mixture of a true intensity field and cosmic rays. We're always in this situation where there's uh, bad data mi mixed in with the good. Uh, OK, good. I'm going to move on to now more like a standard machine learning thing, which is a classification problem. But before I do, should I, I should just pause and say, ask if anybody wants to ask any questions about comets, the web. What is a comet? It's a ball of ice that comes from the outer solar system, evaporates as it comes close to the sun. Um, actually, I don't know very much about comets. One of the funny things is, because I'm very, uh, I, I'm, I really work on the inference side of astronomy, I'm often in a kind of engineering role. Like in that problem, I'm in an engineering role. I don't actually care about the comet itself. I care about the data. Um, OK, let's talk about quasars. Uh, now, quasars, I haven't put up a slide saying what are quasars. Quasars are extremely important objects in cosmology right now. Uh, so the basic things that are out there are stars. A good example of a star is the sun. Planets. A good example of a planet is Jupiter. The Earth is not a good example of a planet because we have never observed any planets anything like the Earth yet. They're getting close, but we're not there yet. Um, 
Now, stars are, are gathered into big collections called galaxies. And a good example of galaxies is the Milky Way. Uh, and I'll also show some pictures of galaxies later on. In the last project, I'll show pictures of galaxies. Uh, but uh, uh, but there is a, a, so, and then galaxies have, you know, 10 billion stars-ish. The Milky Way is quite a typical one, actually. And they are the dominant objects in the universe. So if you look out at the universe as a whole, and you, and you look for things using photons, which is all we've got right now, what you see is galaxies. That's basically the ma majority of things in the universe. But dotted among the galaxies at a much lower rate, there are some called quasars. They're, it's a kind of galaxy, but it has an enormous black hole at the center. And that black hole is incredibly luminous. And these are extremely valuable objects because they're very, very bright. They're very luminous. So you can see them easily to very large distance. So for most of the history of astronomy, the most distant known objects have been uh, quasars. No, most of the history of astrophysics, the most distant uh, objects have been known objects have been quasars. There's no quasar you can see with the naked eye, but the brightest ones are only slightly fainter than you can see with the naked eye. And they extend out to basically as far as uh, you can see anything in the universe, which is, you know, the universe is 13 billion uh, years old. So you can see them out to, you know, 11 billion light years. Uh, and in particular, they're just, well, I'm not going to explain the words here about the baryon acoustic feature and all that stuff. But the, these quasars, because they're so luminous, they're our best tracer for the structure in the universe. It's how we measure. The, the large scale structure, the, the grow, you know, the universe is this very homogeneous thing when it was born and then all the structure forms. How do we measure that growth of structure? A lot of that is done with quasars. So quasars are really key objects uh, in astronomy. The problem is that they look just like stars, meaning they, lo if they look like just a little point of light. They look like little blue points of light. And in fact, the first quasar was discovered uh, because there was a star in the sky that was emitting radio waves, and no one could understand how a star could be emitting so much radio radiation. And somebody took a spectrum of it, and in fact, it's, it's a very famous discovery in astronomy, as Martin Schmidt, uh, realized that the spectrum of the star meant that the star was moving away from us at a significant fraction of the speed of light. And everyone was really confused by that, because it was before we understood that if you saw distant enough objects, they would be receding from you very fast, because the universe is expanding. Um, so uh, so these, the, this is a very, very good classification problem, quasars versus stars. And, uh, and it's a very hard class. It's a very important classification project, because there are far more stars than there are quasars. So if you don't do a good job of this, you spend all of your time taking spectra of stars which, if you want to understand the structure of the universe, is very boring. Um, now, if you want to understand stars, that's great. And a lot of people who've gone out to study quasars have ended up doing more interesting science on the stars, because they did a bad job of doing their classification. Um, now, we, I'm part of a big project called BOSS, which is part of SDSS3. It's a long story, but we have millions of dollars riding on our ability to find the quasars from among the stars and take the spectra of them. So uh, we have to do this right. Uh, and uh, uh, it, the punchline I'm, I'm about to tell you is that we succeeded. And, and my group with Joe Bovey, who I mentioned on the first slide, uh, found, made the best classifier that, that has been found for this problem. Um, it's, you might, it looks like a good problem, because you know in advance. So when we started, we had about 10 to the 4, maybe 30,000, 10,000 or 30,000 quasars known with the properties that we want. So looks good. We can just run a SVM with the kernel trick, and we'll kick ass. The only problem is that the quasars that we know about are brighter and therefore higher in signal to noise than the quasars we're trying to get. And this is completely generic in astronomy. The objects you're trying to find are always fainter and crappier than the objects you already know. After all, nowadays, it's no longer interesting to find Jupiter-sized planets. You have to find Neptune-sized planets. 
And methods that work on Jupiter-sized planets won't work on Neptune-sized planets, and so on. And then after we get the Neptune-sized planets under control, we'll be looking for the Earth-sized planets. Um, and, uh, and so this is the generic problem in astronomy, is how do you take a high signal-to-noise training set and, uh, and do well at classification? OK, so uh, I just mentioned support vector machines which are really awesome in this context. In fact, there's quite a few papers now in astronomy that really are, are uh, uh, getting great success with support vector machines. Um, the problem with these methods is, in general, they require uh, test data to have the same error properties as the training data. And one of the things I failed to do, because my talk was today and not tomorrow, as I had thought, is make a little demo of this. I was going to make a little demo showing that as I turn up the the noise, or turn down the signal to noise on a data set, the, th the choices that a decision system like an SVM makes change as you change the signal to noise. And that means that the, the cuts that an SVM will decide on for a high signal to noise data set just won't work uh, for a low signal to noise data set. But there's another problem, which is that there's no astronomical data set of any size that I know of where all of the dimensions are measured for all of the objects. It's just not possible. So for instance, the imaging we're using here was based on a single pass of the telescope across the sky. Well, that pass gets battered by cosmic rays. If a cosmic ray hits the image where your quasar is, you just lose one of the measurements in one of the bands. So you're supposed to have five band imaging on everything, but in fact, there's a lot of objects on which you only have four bands of imaging. There's some on which you only have three. Sometimes one of the CCDs goes dead for a while. And you might think, oh, well, let's just throw away those data. But there's two problems. One is that's a lot of data, and we care about it. And the other thing, which is much more serious, is we're using these quasars to measure the large-scale structure of the universe. We're using them to make a map of the large-scale structure. So dropping objects in a non-random way from that map <coughs> leaves non-random structure in the map that we end up with. So it makes it very hard to use the results for uh, cosmology. So we need methods that can, that can work no matter what measurements are measured and given that and, and making use of the property that every uh, object will have different uh, signal to noise, different error properties. And those things are not true in general. Okay, good. Uh, okay, good. So the approach that we take is density modeling. So we try to actually model the distribution of points in the space, in the observed space. But we try to make that model understand the noise model so that as we change the error properties of each object, the model changes. So in fact, every object gets a custom model based on its error properties. So the idea is that there's a true density. I should put that in quotation marks because I'm starting to become one of these people who doesn't believe in the model parameters, um, and, uh, which I think is the generic case in here. If you're a probabilistic modeler, you, know, you tend to not believe that the internal model parameters have any meaning. Um, so I, I should say the true density. So you think of there being a true density of points in the observed space, but then every individual object doesn't sample that true density. It samples that true density convolved with its uncertainty properties. It has errors, and that convolves the model. And then we model this with mixtures of Gaussians. The reason we use mixtures of Gaussians is actually just because convolutions are really easy there. So we do everything with mixtures of Gaussians to make all the math fast. Um, and then our likelihood ratios that we want, or our posterior probabilities, or whichever you want to think about it, become density ratios. Um, missing data. I will come back. I'm not sure if I put in enough slides about missing data, but one really key point is imagine a data point is missing an observation completely. That's not a problem in this context. It just means that the d true distribution convolved with the object's uncertainties just has infinite width in that unobserved dimension. Or you can think of it as you can, you can project the space down into the subspace where it has observations. You can take the model and project it and then work in the projected space. That, we, that's actually what we do. We, work, we project the model down to the subspace that's observed for each object. And there's a lot of problems in astronomy where 
where every object is missing data. So for instance, one kind of problem we work on a lot is trying to understand the velocity distribution of stars. And at each star, you measure a radial velocity. You measure a radial velocity for that star, you measure a radial velocity for that star, you measure radial velocity for that star, but you want the three-dimensional velocity distribution that the stars are drawn from, and you're measuring only a one-dimensional quantity for each star. So you're missing two dimensions for every star, and the way we solve that problem is we project the model down to the dimension that you've observed for each star. Um, so the same thing is happening here when we're missing data. Um, okay, good, and I've said this now a million times, with typical density estimation methods, say you were going to just use KDE or whatever people use these days. I don't know what it is. Um, uh, like if you just fit a mixture of Gaussians to the data or if you do some, some local density estimator. Um, the problem is just the problem I've said, which is that if data sets have different signal to noise or different error models, the density you estimate on one set will not apply to the other. So if you take the high signal to noise quasars, I'm about to show you this. If you take the high signal to noise quasars and measure the density, it won't look like the low signal to noise quasars. And one of the things that's maybe different about astronomy than a lot of uh, areas that, that people in here work on is that the data that we use always comes with really good uncertainty estimates. Astronomers, there's a culture in astronomy of producing correct and justifiable noise models. I mean, you never really know whether your noise model is correct, but in as much as you can, it's really part of the community effort to do that. And therefore, if you're, if you're using a data analysis method that does not make use of the uncertainties or the noise model, you're making a mistake in astronomy. Because uh, astronomers really, there's a very good culture of that in astronomy, and it, it makes astronomy kind of unusual. So a lot of, you know, when I go to NIPS or AI stats and I see talks, often the things that are being presented are not really applicable to astronomy because there's no easy way to put the errors in and, and I'm not going to spend the huge research program to do that. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm looking for when I'm looking at the machine learning community is I'm looking for methods that ma generate the data, that produce a model of the data as it's produced because that's a, as it's produced by the instrument, because that's a kind of approach where the noise model is going to be part of the, the, uh, the model. Um, okay, good, so in standard EM density estimation, so the standard kind of thing where you're just, mo you're modeling a distribution of points with a mixture, there's some mixture of Gaussians, this is my mixture of Gaussians, and there's a probability for each data point given that mixture, and then you product together those probabilities, and you try to find the maximum likelihood uh, mixture components, or if you're Zubin, you find the posterior distribution over all possible mixtures um, that is consistent with the data, or that has uh, given, the, given the data. Um, what we do, which this is called extreme deconvolution, that's just the moniker that we gave the project so that we can be found on the web. By the way, as I say, all of our code's on the web. We're on code.google.com or something. And there's a paper here. Uh, this is the archive indicator for the paper. But anyway, it's very easy to find. We're, if you just type that into a browser, you'll find us, except maybe not in this room. Um, but it, the, the model is exactly the same as the model I just showed you. There's a mixture of Gaussians, which have variances. But for each object we add to the variance, the variance which comes from its own uncertainty measurements. And these measurements are actually have very, very close to Gaussian errors, it turns out. The measurements that, the photometric measurements from optical telescopes have very close to Gaussian errors. That's not quite true, but it's very close. And so this is, a, this model, for the model we have for this data point is based on the the, the Gaussian components from this sort of true distribution then convolved with the uncertainty information for that object. So one of the things that I find amusing about this model is that every object is being compared to its own special distribution function. The every object has different error properties in general, therefore every object is actually being compared to a different probability distribution with the same latent variables. Yes? So when you're talking about objects here, have you pre-specified the stars or the galaxies, or are the objects just like pixel intensities and then ah, good. that's 
Yeah, I've been very unclear. Absolutely, I've been extremely unclear. So in this case, what the data are are the five photometric measurements in five band passes of one object, which is either a star or a quasar, we don't know which. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna train, we're gonna learn these parameters on a subset where we do know that they're galaxies, and on, I mean, do know that they're stars, and on another subset where we do know that they're quasars. And then we're going to, when we do, when we optimize that model, we're gonna use the uncertainties, and then when we use the model, we're also gonna use the uncertainties. Uh, yeah, yeah, good. The, uh, I keep saying galaxies, but because I'm also working on star galaxy classification, but this is star quasar classification, so everything's either a star or a quasar, and all the stars, yes, are in our own Milky Way. You know, there's a lot of classification problems where you're trying to decide whether it's, you know, a, a, a squirrel or a chipmunk, and maybe there's a continuum between squirrels and chipmunks, but here there is absolutely no continuum between stars and quasars. It's either an incredibly distant quasar that is an enormous accreting black hole at very large distance, or it is a tiny little star in our own galaxy very, very nearby. There's no, they're really completely different objects, and it's just a pain in the ass that they look identical. Um, but yeah, so here the data are photometric measurements. And really, you, you're right that we should be thinking in terms of the images. We should be going earlier in the data stream but, but anyway, that's where we're at. Uh, okay, good. Now, this looks incredibly similar to EM, like the kind of EM Gaussian mixtures things that people use all the time. And indeed it is. And Sam Royce generalized the standard EM algorithm to solve this problem, to optimize this problem. And that's what's written up in this paper. And uh, uh, with you know Sam-like proofs and all those things, uh, but it's uh, but it is really really much harder to optimize this problem than to optimize the standard one. It's a much harder problem, and the reason is you're effectively deconvolving. Whenever you're deconvolving, you always have less handle on your latent variables. Um, the reason why yeah. you call it deconvolving is because you estimate this SI for each object. No, no, that th that's yeah you. You're thinking blind, so this is not a blind deconvolution. We know these. These are delivered to us by the experiment. Okay. It's called deconvolution because you're inferring higher resolution model than you're observing, which I think is what the meaning of the word deconvolve is. So this is a convolution step, right? This, I've taken a mixture of Gaussians and convolved it with this variance tensor. So if I infer this, I've effectively deconvolved. And it's called extreme because every single data point has its own distribution function that has to be deconvolved. So it's different from image deconvolution because in image deconvolution, there's a point spread function that, uh, that covers the whole image. Although it's similar to the deconvolution where the point spread function varies, which I think you guys have been working on, right? I think Hirsch said something about that. Um, Okay, good. Uh, I just, I said all that uh, uncer uh, missing data thing, so I'm not gonna say that again. How are you doing for time? It's nearly time for a break. Okay, let me show you. I will show you this and then we'll break. Okay, now, this is a very hard figure to understand, but th there aren't that many things we need to know about it. Okay, so first thing is, Look at this panel here. This is a distribution, this is actually for stars. These are stars that can be confused with quasars. And we have a similar plot for the quasars that can be confused with stars. But this is, these are, this is a ratio of two, this axis, we're plotting a ratio of two of the brightness measurements, and here we're, measure, we're plotting a different ratio. And in the log with various minus signs, there's all sorts of crazy things astronomers do. But let's just think of this as some kind of projection of the data space. So the data is truly five-dimensional, and this is some 2D projection of the data. This is a different 2D projection of the data, and so on, okay? So here's a 2D projection of the data, and these are data that are taken at low signal-to-noise, okay? And this is the exact same data set taken at higher signal-to-noise. So this is literally, the way we made this plot is we just threw away some of the observations we have to lower the signal-to-noise. And here we included all those observations that we got higher signal-to-noise. <coughs> So you can see the differences between the low signal-to-noise and the high signal-to-noise. 
See how at low signal to noise, the distribution is fatter? And it's hard to see some of the features, like for instance, there's some interesting structure here. This structure is extremely relevant because this structure are white dwarf stars that are very interesting objects and also very confusing with quasars. Um, so, the, and you see how that structure doesn't really appear here? Um, so, uh, so there are, you can see that there's a lot of differences there. Now, this is a demonstration that things work. What we've done now is we've now made a model using these data. We used only these data to build the model, and now we're going to predict these data. And there's the model. That's the model, where we've used these data to construct the model, and we're predicting the other. And you see how we can actually predict the higher signal-to-noise data using the lower signal-to-noise data? Now, we don't get everything right. In particular, we don't get all the structure that is down here. So we don't see everything. The other thing is, if you, if you have really sharp eyes, you'll see that we're slightly wrong on this side of the distribution. And I actually think that has something to do with our assumption that the errors are Gaussian. There's a tail to the errors that go beyond Gaussian, and I think we're making a mistake. But, damn, it's pretty good. And second of all, my conjecture is that given that astronomers have very high precision requirements and understand their errors, if you cannot use low signal-to-noise data to predict high signal-to-noise data, you will never perform well. That's my conjecture um, in any of these projects that we're interested in now in modern astronomy. Well, we do beat all other methods. So for, this is a figure which I'm not going to explain, but it, it says that we, our method for doing the quasar target selection beats all other methods. Now, unfortunately, the astronomers, being astronomers, have not done a very good job of exercising machine learning community. And for instance, an SVM has not been run yet in this problem. And I know an SVM performs well. Like just somebody turned one on without any tuning or anything and did okay, but not nearly as well as our results. One interesting question is, we're thinking of putting this problem up as a challenge, because if we put it up as a challenge, maybe we'll get people to come in and try and beat us. And hopefully we would get beaten. Uh, but, I, but, I, but I have a conjecture. I would learn something if we got beaten. But my conjecture is that if you don't model, if you don't use the uncertainty information properly, you don't model the data generating process, you won't beat us. That's my conjecture. Um, and then I say this here. The reason we perform well is we use the errors correctly. And then there's, because it's a probabilistic model, it has these value. Probabilistic models have a lot of value that go beyond performance. Yes, it performs well, and that's all we cared about here. We, we became the, we won the contest internally in our system to be the best quasar target selection. But, um, but actually, probabilistic models are very valuable for other reasons as a scientist, because as scientists, you take other kinds of data. You take other data of the sky, and you want to include those other data in your, in your, uh, in your inferences. It's trivial if it's, a, you know, we have a likelihood function, so we can just multiply in the likelihood functions of other data that come in, and then th that just improves our classifications. And we have, in fact, done that. So the final target selection uses all data that are available when they are available. Um, and we're on code.google.com if you want to use our code. Um, OK, good. I'm going to break here, and we'll do the third part uh, in five minutes.